Hey folks, welcome to Eigen Designs, and in today's video, we're going to be focusing on Shop Dust Collection. I'm going to be replacing my 12-year-old Delta Single Stage Dust Collector with a 3-horsepower Cyclone Dust Collector from Grizzly. Now this video is going to be more than an unboxing because I'm going to dive into the fundamentals of physics of how a Cyclone Dust Collector works and how it's different from a Single Stage Dust Collector. I'm also going to be using an anemometer to measure wind speeds throughout my system before and after the upgrade and analyzing the results to see what really changed in the system and the results might surprise you. Before I changed anything in my dust collection system, I made sure to establish a performance baseline of how my dust collection system is functioning with the single stage Delta dust collector. Now before taking any air velocity measurements, I made sure to clean my dust collector so that I was pulling maximum airflow. On the back end of my dust collector, I've got a Y. One part goes to my CNC machine and the other Y feeds a four inch trunk line that powers the rest of my shop. This four inch PVC line has a Y one part goes to my eight inch jointer. And then through a series of blast gates, I can control flow to go through this flex hose, which can either power my downdraft table, which is under this black panel, or it can be routed to go to my table saw. And there's a Y that feeds the bottom part of the table saw and the overhead dust collection system. Now I modeled my dust collection system into SketchUp You'll notice it looks a little bit different because this was modeled for the uh, new three horsepower cyclone dust collector, but you'll notice a number near all the key nodes where I'm going to be taking measurements. There's a total of six different places where I'll be taking air velocity measurements, and we're going to use that to analyze the results at the end of this video. To help measure the air velocity at these six different nodes within my system, I'll be using this anemometer from BT meter. This is good for up to 30 meters per second, which is about 67 miles per hour. And I will later learn that that's not enough for the new system, but more on that later. I started off by taking measurements at each one of the points and documenting them into uh, my notebook. I'm going to share those results at the end. But as I'm going through each one of these measurements, one thing I do want to mention, the scope of this video is really focused on upgrading the dust collector and measuring the impacts of the dust collector and then using that data to find, are there areas of my system that are ripe for optimization, right? So I'm running a four inch line in my, in my shop and I use a lot of hose and I know both of those things are not optimal. I should probably have a six inch trunk line for the air flows that I've got. Um, but that's gonna be the subject of a future video. This, this video is really just gonna be focusing on the dust collector. So stay tuned if you wanna see part two at some point in time in the future. Let me take some time to explain how the two systems are different. In a single stage system, you have your flow coming into the impeller. So your sawdust and your chips are actually going through the impellers. And then there's a connecting tube that actually puts the mixture into the filtration system itself. Upon entering the system, all those particulates are still airborne. And so your filter has to do all the heavy lifting when it comes to filtering out any solid particulates that you don't want coming out into the air. Now this system has a canister filter on top, but sometimes you see a filtration bag. Now I've worked with our graphics department here at Eigen Designs to show you that the longer you use a single stage dust collector in between cleanings, the less efficient it becomes. That's because the actual pore spaces in the filter become clogged with those fine particulates, which almost suffocates the system, uh, restricting airflow out through the filter itself. Now let's contrast that with the performance of a cyclone system. Now those are generally taller and they've got a conical shape down the bottom. The airflow enters in through the top, usually offset from the center, and it creates a spiral flow pattern inside the canister known as a vortex. Now this vortex gives all the particles in that flow stream angular velocity. And because they have angular velocity and they have a mass, they're subject to centrifugal force. This is the force that you might feel if you're taking a corner in your car at high speeds, it kind of feels like it's pushing you away from the center of a curve. It's that same principle. So the heavier dust particles are pushed to the sides of the canister and they slide down and the clean air, which is lighter in weight, less mass, is exhausted through the center of the vortex and it goes up and over 
through the filtration of the dust canister on the right hand side. So two key things to note. One is the raw flow does not come in through the impellers of the unit. And two, 99.9% .9 of the particles are removed in the cyclone stage and they never reach the filter. As a result, the efficiency of a dust collector remains higher for longer because the filter isn't having to do all the heavy lifting of filtering out those particles. That's happening in the cyclone separator. I'll be going through the unboxing relatively quickly, mainly because there wasn't really that much to it. Now, it did arrive in three different boxes. The box that you see me opening here had the main dust filter in it, the canister filter, as well as the drum, which is going to hold all the dust once it's all set up. The larger box that you see here had the actual conical component as well as the uh, inlet for the airflow and the motor housing with the three horsepower motor in it. This small box had some little knick-knack pieces in it for the top of the filter uh, and a little accordion style um, hose ring that's going to connect the cyclone to the dust canister box as well as all the other, you know, tightening bands and vacuum hoses and caster wheels and stuff that goes along with the unit. This last box contained the two green frame pieces that keeps everything elevated and put together. Once all the parts were out of the boxes and laid out on the ground, I took a quick inventory, had all parts accounted for, and I began the assembly process, which took about an hour. I got to this stage and I needed the help of a friend because the motor housing with the 15 inch cast iron impellers weighs well over hundred pounds. So you really need two people to help you with that particular part. After my buddy came by and helped me put that motor housing on top, everything else came together relatively quickly. It was a combination of hex screws, uh, Allen keys and nuts that keeps everything together. And the instructions on the assembly were pretty clear. Now, as I was building this, the shop manager decided to come down and have an inspection of my work and make sure that the hose was up to standard and up to code. He did a pretty thorough inspection, as you can see in the background, and I think he was happy with what he saw. The last piece of this puzzle was to run a 220 outlet behind the dust collector. So I ran some half inch conduit from my breaker box across the top of my garage and dropped it down just behind where the dust collector was going to live. I did decide to run a 30 amp breaker on this circuit because I had read reviews that the 20 amp breakers would get tripped upon startup. So to avoid this, I just ran the larger 30 amp breaker. Once the outlet was installed and the dust collector was in its final location, it was time to turn it on. My initial reaction about the noise is that it was similar to my previous unit, maybe a little bit louder. Um, no vibrational issues that I felt on the motor housing itself, so I think the impellers are pretty well balanced. You'll notice that I did have to change out this part of the piping section to make it fit the new orientation of the outlet. Um, again, the scope of redesigning my entire dust collection ducting system was not really in scope, but I did have to make that one modification. I also decided to add this new remote control onto my uh, working apron so that anytime I've got my apron on, I can turn the dust collector off and on at will. That's pretty cool. At this point in time, I was super excited and I certainly didn't want to be taking airflow measurements before trying out my new toy. So I decided to run some MDF through the table saw for a different project I was working on because that's one of the most dust heavy substances that you can cut on a table saw. So I made uh, four rip cuts through this MDF and overall the dust collection was fantastic. The only time the dust actually came out of the table saw was at the very end of the cut where it's making its final exit through the material. But uh, you'll see here in just a second after four uh, sequential cuts through this MDF, there's very little dust remaining on the uh, table saw itself and all the stuff that would normally be airborne is getting sucked up by the vent hood directly above the table saw blade. And for those who watch my channel for the CNC content, this is going to be a part of a broader CNC upgrade that I'm doing for the dust collection and the spoil board. So make sure you're subscribed because that content's going to be coming out next week. And after four cuts of MDF, you can see the table saw is looking pretty clean. 
Again, whenever you make that exit cut, that's where most of the chips kind of come out behind the table saw. But what's most interesting is that in the actual bag itself, there's almost no dust, which means that the cyclone action is separating, you know, darn near everything that comes into it, which is a real big plus. So after playing with my new toy, it was time to collect some data and establish a new performance baseline for the shop. But the anemometer that I was using before didn't have enough range to capture the air velocities that we had in the system now. So I had to get a new one, which has a capacity for 45 meters a second instead of 30 meters a second. And as soon as I try to take the inlet speeds, it was too high, which means that the inlet speeds are higher than 45 meters a second. And for context, that's 100 miles an hour. That's wind speeds equivalent to a category two hurricane, which is crazy. But to get around this issue, I took the measurement just upstream of the inlet and it was right at the cusp of what the tool was capable of. But I guess it was around 45 meters a second right there at the inlet. I then repeated this process at the remaining nodes to collect the wind speeds with this new system. I'm speeding through this part because I wanna to get to the results, which I think is the most interesting part of this. Okay, now on to the results. I'll get into the analysis of what these results mean in just a second, but first I want to go back to how this is all set up. So if you remember the SketchUp model that I showed you earlier in this video, you see my shop layout and you saw six numbers. So these are the six different nodes at which I took air velocity measurements. If you look at the pathway from my dust collector to my table saw, you follow nodes one, two, three, and then nodes four and five are part of the table saw. Number four is on the bottom part of the cabinet table saw, and five is the overhead dust collection. The pathway to my jointer goes from the dust collector, which is one, through two, and then six. So let's first look at the table saw. And the data that we're gonna be looking at is gonna be flow rate instead of velocity. So you can get the flow rate, the volumetric flow rate, by multiplying the air velocity by the cross-sectional area of the pipe that it's going through, in which case it's four inches for most of my system. So if you look at nodes four and five, those are both part of the table saw. So what I thought would be most representative is to combine those two pieces, since node number four is the bottom inlet to the cabinet table saw and number five is the overhead dust collector. So when you combine the airflow of four and five, this is the relationship that you get. And right away, you can see the new system more than doubles the airflow at the table saw, which is great. Upon diving a little bit deeper into the data, I had a few key insights that came out of it. The first of which is the majority of the airflow loss in the system is occurring in that stretch of flexible hose between nodes two and three. So if you look across at my system to jump from the hard piping duct over to the plumbing of my table saw, you have to go through a flex hose, which can be between 10 and 20 feet. That's where the majority of the loss is. Um, about 43% of the airflow is lost from the dust collector getting all the way through to my table saw, which is pretty substantial. The other thing I noticed is that the rate of airflow loss is more than two times higher in flex hose than PVC pipe. This is the type of information that will be really helpful whenever I do a part two to this video and completely redesign the duct work for this system to optimize airflow to each one of my pieces of equipment. Now let's take a look at the airflow at the jointer. So the ducting run going from the dust collector at node one to the jointer at node six is pretty ideal. There's no 90s, there's only 45s, and it's more or less straight pipe and minimal flex hose. So you see a pretty linear relationship in the airflow loss across each of the nodes. What's interesting is that the relationship between the old setup and the new setup is almost the same. You just see that line shifted up because there's been a whole lot more horsepower added to the system. I am surprised to see that there's still a 30% reduction in airflow across the system. That was a bit of a surprise to me. But there is ample airflow at the jointer. More on that in just a second. But after looking at the data and my piping system in general, I think if I wanted to optimize it to a great extent, it would have to involve using a larger diameter ductwork. The larger diameter will give a bigger cross-sectional area for the flow rates to travel through, in which case it would reduce the velocities and reduce the frictional losses. So that'll have to be a part of part two whenever this video series continues. The last thing I want to look at is the minimum required flow rates at each of the major tools in your shop. This data was published by Woodworking Magazine, and I've used it here to reference against the data that I've collected. Let's first look at the table saw, which says that you need 350 CFMs for operation, 
and the data shows that we've got about 440 CFMs now, whereas before we didn't have enough for minimum requirements. You also see that a jointer needs about 440 CFMs, and our data that we collected show that we're approaching 600, whereas before we were at 350. So I think this data is incredibly helpful because I know that my ducting system is not optimized and there's a lot of room for improvement, but I do take comfort in knowing that I'm delivering the required CFMs to each of my key pieces of equipment, and that makes me feel good about the purchase that I just made. All right, I really hope you enjoyed this video. I took a very engineering-based approach to this particular video, tried to outline the fundamentals of physics in play and take a data-driven approach to quantifying the magnitude of the upgrades and analyzing the data of where the losses in the system are coming from. And I hope people out there find it valuable as they're trying to decide what type of dust collection systems great for them. Remember, the CNC video will be dropping next week, so stay tuned for that, and I will see you on the next one. Thank you.